presentation. Uh, so I'm glad you could join us tonight. Um, why don't you take it over, Mike, when you're ready. Okay. Um, and now I have it recording. So good evening, everyone. Let's see if we can get to the presentation now. There we go. So basically tonight we're going to talk about birding uh, tips and tricks. Birding is a big business in Oregon. Uh, people spend $776 million each year. Oregon's a great place to go birding. 507 species have been recorded in Oregon, which is 53% of the total number of species seen in the U.S. So that's pretty good. Oregon's really a pretty great birding place. Uh, not quite as good as Arizona or Texas. California has quite a few also, uh, but it ranks right up there. It's nice because in Oregon we have 10 uh, major ecosystems and we're on the Pacific Flyway, which is a major migratory uh, route for the birds going up into um, a summer and spring and summer and down into fall. So what is the big deal? Well, birds really have a great appeal. They're beautiful. They're pretty much everywhere. Doesn't take much money. You don't even need binoculars. It's good to have them, but you could do it without. And trying to remember all these birds, it does keep your mind active. And I agree with this, a very friendly group of folks. If you're out there and have a question to ask somebody, they're very willing to help. But I think the key point I put out today is that birding is whatever you want it to be. Some people are very competitive. They're trying to get their life list and get as many birds as they can. Other people are just out enjoying nature and just want to take it easy and not be competitive, and that's fine. So one thing I'd tell you is each one of you already know many of these birds and probably know more birds than you thought. Um, here we have the American Kestrel. Of course, I'm sure everyone knows this, the Mallard. Here we have the great horned owl, a bush tit, of course the robin, iconic robin, and scrub jay. Um, so the main thing is you want, with birds, you want to look at the detail first and notice the details. Look at the bird. Um, you can uh, then develop a frame of reference to use to ID other birds. For example, it's bigger than a robin. It's smaller than a sparrow or bush tit. There aren't too many birds that are smaller than those, but you get the idea that it's uh, the size of a crow. Um, I'm going to play some sounds. Now, this is not a bush tit. I'm sure many of you have heard this sound. It's a very good sound. I love to hear it. It's uh, a black Let me close the other one. But now, this is a very familiar song. It's early in the morning, the dawn song. But it's a robin. Take a look at uh, this droopy wings here, and I want you that the next uh, page, take a look at and see if you can pick out the bird that's like this. And so let's go on to the, probably have heard this one too. So California scrub jay. There we go. So now, um, the uh, size and shape is really important when you're birding 
to get to know the sizes and shapes, sort of from the small to the large here, and you can even go on beyond a crow and go to a goose. But you can say it was the size of a sparrow. It was a little uh, bigger than a robin, but smaller than a crow. You can see by the silhouettes, for example, the robin, like we saw in the previous photo, here's that droopy wing. And then here's the cedar wax wing. You can see that little bit of tip of the crown raising up, and same with the J. But start each bird by identifying it, by trying to focus on the shape and the size. Think of the silhouettes like these. And once you get these in your mind, it will really be helpful. Flying, uh, when they're in flight, that will also help uh, if you start to recognize them in flight. Uh, shape and the methods that they fly have a great deal uh, to do with how you can ID them. For example, a starling, when it's flying, looks like a triangle. For example, then we can go to a mallard. You wonder why some of these birders can just see a bird flying in the distance and say, oh, that's such and such. Well, they've observed uh, the size and the shape of it and the flight pattern. Uh, for example, a mallard, when it flies, has a very straight neck. Um, it has blue-purple speculum in the wing. If it's close enough when it's flying, you see in the wing here, uh, the blue uh, purple. And also its leg position, uh, when a mallard is flying, its legs are held real tight to the lower body and its legs don't extend past the tail. So some of those details that uh, those birds can use to determine what it is. Um, also, you can say like a crow has real smooth rowing wing beats, like rowing a boat, while a raven has shallower uh, wing beats that are more like paddling wing beats. And often ravens, when you know a little bit about their behavior, that can help too, because ravens often soar, but crows don't. Now, we were talking about how many birds you uh, probably really know. Well, here's some silhouettes of birds. There's 19 birds here. Let's just take a few minutes and see how many birds can you identify here by their silhouette. I'll give you a couple minutes to... So one thing to think of here, it's called G-I-S-S, -S, and that stands for General Impression Size and Shape. So here with the silhouette, you're trying to uh, get an impression of the bird through its size and shape and look at the bill, the primary length of the uh, wings in comparison to the tail. Then another good thing is to do is to try to put these birds in a group. For example, oh, I can tell this is a sparrow. This is a hummingbird. This is a dove. This is a shorebird. And once you can put in that category, then it helps you really narrow down the possibilities of what it could be. Um, for example, a hummingbird. So you see a hummingbird and you see it in Oregon. Well, you've already then narrowed it down to seven to eight species when you include Central and Eastern Oregon. And in Western Oregon, depending where you're located, you could have narrowed it down to oh, possibly three or four hummingbirds. 
So that can really help you when there's 10,000 birds in the world and um, 700 plus in the United States, it helps to be able to narrow it down a little. And for example, in for hummingbirds, there's 350 in the world, about 18 to 22 in the US and seven to eight in Oregon. So let's go over these birds. <clears throat> I'll get tell you the ones I got most of them, but not all of them, because some of them are a little tough. Of course, down here we have a duck. We have a kingfisher up here. Have a woodpecker here. Have an owl here. Looks like a blue jay here. <clears throat> Looks like quail down here. Um, not sure this long one for sure there. Uh, this looks like a grackle. This one looks like a starling because it doesn't have any tail at all. Of course, this is a morning dove. I'm not positive about this one unless it's a sparrow. This uh, looks like a swallow. This one I would say would be a kestrel, a crow. Looks like a meadowlark singing. Could be a shorebird here. And probably could be a sparrow there, for example. So on most of them, you can tell just by their shape and where they're positioned. For example, the woodpecker or the duck, a lot of these just give it away as to you know, what they possibly are. So when you see a bird, how do you go about identifying it? <clears throat> as we said earlier, stop and look at the bird first. Notice all the details. Size, shape, color, the habitat, <clears throat> behavior. So don't focus just on one feature, look at the whole bird. What I like to do, other than when I'm the bad person in the group and say, oh, this is such and such right away. But if I'm out there and I uh, following my uh, instructions here, take a nice look at the bird, start at the bill and work your way down towards the tail. How long is that bill? Uh, what's the size and shape of the head? Um, how is the coloring on the breast, the uh, throat? How about the eye? Is it, what's its eye color? Go down the back and the breast. Uh, what color are the legs? How long of a tail does it have? Is a tail notched or not? Uh, quite a few things you can get and then start, then start looking at the coloration of the bird. And by going through that, uh, it will really help you. For example, in habitat, uh, sparrows, a lot of sparrows can be near marshes or water, like a song sparrow. They like wet areas. And in season, you got to take in consideration the season. For example, in the late spring and uh, summer, we'll have swings and thrushes here in the valley, where in the winter, probably won't see a swings and thrush, they migrate south. You could see a hermit thrush any time of year, but we normally see hermit thrush more in the winter. Uh, so the season's quite important. Also think of uh, osprey and turkey vultures. Here in the spring and summer, but in the fall and winter, they're down south, where, for example, a red-tailed hawk is here year-round. So there's quite a few birds that could be here year-round. Watch their behavior, very important. For example, a flycatcher, you'll see them up on a high perch or tree and dart out, grab an insect, and come back to the perch. They'll come out and return to the same perch. A golden crowned sparrow. In the winter, when they're around down at Minto Brown Park, you'll see them out on the ground. You'll see quite a few together. They're very sociable. Where a Lincoln sparrow, for example, they're very solitary and not in flocks. Uh, like out at the Ankeny National Wildlife Refuge, Eagle Marsh, sometimes when we see them, you'll see one. So that can be another clue. Also the location, 
uh, the diversity of habitats and the elevation. Some birds during the summer go up in elevation to breed, such as the dark-eyed jungle, although some stay in the valley. And then there's other birds that uh, go up in elevation. So those are some of those things to keep in mind. So when you see a bird, so example, here are some more things we're looking for. For example, here on the right, likely this is a wren. Wrens like to keep their tails up in the air, held up in the air. While this one over here, likely that's a flycatcher because flycatchers keep their tail down. Keep an eye on their flight. For example, here in one, uh, it's likely a woodpecker or a finch, they have undulating flight. Whereas a dove, they're pretty, a pretty direct flight, for, especially for a morning dove. Where here we see a kingfisher, it will sort of hover and then dive into the water to try to get, um, so observe the, some of the behavior you're seeing. And here, a good clue, here we have a brown creeper going up the tree. Uh, woodpeckers also go up the tree, where nuthatches most of the time, they go from the top down the tree. And now ducks. You can see some of them uh, floating here. So here uh, we have a diving duck, one and three is a diving duck. You can see how deep it is in the water. That's one clue here, there's a diving duck. Uh, and here it is diving in the water versus here's the dabbling duck. It's not in the water quite as much and you see the butts in the air type of thing. So it's dabbling and trying to get uh, things off the bottom uh, vegetation and stuff off the bottom. But uh, some other things um, about the ducks uh, too is um, that, for example, the dabbling duck, we're talking about mallards, northern shovelers, wood ducks, American widgeon, pintail would be other ones, uh, uh, teal, where the diving ducks, we're talking about uh, ringneck ducks, bufflehead, uh, ruddy ducks, scop, and mergansers, for example. Another interesting thing with uh, the ducks is um, a diving duck, because of the way it is structured and with its body this far in the water, for example, it's uh, to be able to dive, it has a shorter, narrower wings. So when it wants to leave the water and gets flushed, it's gonna have to take a running start before it can start getting up and get into flight. Where the dabbling ducks have a little longer wings and broader wings, and they can just take off right from the water. They don't have to get a running start. So that's another clue that you can look out when you're looking at a lake or a pond or down at Minto Brown Park. If you see the duck take directly off the water without running, then you know it's a dabbling duck and that's narrowed down your choices. Where if it's taking a running across the water, then you know it's a diving duck. Another thing with the hawks, exhibitors like your Cooper's hawk and sharp shinned hawk have a very direct flight. Where your butios, like your red tailed hawk, red shouldered hawk, they have more of a rotating, they sort of go in circles as they're flying above and uh, in the air. And also take a look at the wings and the wingspan pretty flat, but a little bit of a wave in the wing for the red-tailed hawk. You'll notice bald eagle, big, huge wings and a long, pretty straight across. A turkey vulture, they um, get way up in the sky as they glide and they have a, more of a V shape. Also, you can tell by their behavior in the air, they'll wobble a little as they're flying. Well, the black vulture has a pretty flat flight. And another one with a dihedral or that B flight is a Northern Harrier. 
usually it's flying close to the ground using both its eyes and hearing to hear for uh, rodents and varmints and stuff so it can catch its meal. But just the other day, I was a little surprised. I did see um, a Northern Harrier soaring pretty high in the air, him and I did out of Ankeny. So don't let things fool you. Sometimes they can have a little different behavior. So other uh, tips, uh, I would say learn as much as you can by the sounds, birding by ear. I don't know if we'll have any class. I'm not great at this. I'm learning all the time, uh, but uh, you can take classes. I know Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a class um, on it. There's some good books out there to learn. Some new books have just come out in the last year. Uh, so learning the bird sounds is really helpful because a lot of times um, you're out there and you don't see the bird and you only hear it. And in some cases, that's 80% of the time. Of course, I'd a lot rather see the bird. Uh, Tim and I were very lucky the other day when we went to Battle uh, Creek Park in South Salem. When we were out there, we probably saw 90% of the birds. So that was uh, very enjoyable, but it's not that way all the time. Uh, identifying features. Um, like look for breast spots on sparrows, but they're not always there. So that's not the best single ID. It could be oil or water, for example. Uh, use more than one feature like we talked about before in IDing a bird. You just don't want to say, oh, that's such and such with only, it's black. Well, there's quite a few black birds out there. So you want to look at a lot more like we talked about the bill, head shape, the size and shape, etc. So just don't get hooked up on uh, one feature. Now, like another thing you could get hung up on is like the crown, raised feathers in the crown. A lot of different birds can have raised uh, feathers in their crown, such as a, a sparrow, flycatcher, kinglet, and even a roadrunner from Arizona. Some people say, oh, there was white on the Churchills. So it's a summer tanager. Well, not so fast. It's a red bird, but uh, what if the rest of the bird is white? And it's not all red, and you're just saying it's white Churchills. Also is on a pond. It could be a swan for all we know but you have to look at the whole bird. Okay, let's keep on a couple more tips like impids or those are your uh, fly catchers like the willow fly catcher, uh, Pacific slope fly catcher, Hammond's fly catcher, upgrade fly catcher. So in these type, they're really hard to ID. The best way to ID is by their call, but you can look at the bill and the tail and what we call the primary projection, how far the primaries come down on the tail. And their behavior is important too. And like we said, it called, for example, a gray flycatcher pumps his tail down. And it's one of the only ones that does that. And you wanna be careful that, um, you say you saw a fox sparrow well, in the valley, most likely it's our common city fox sparrow. But let's say you were in central Oregon, it could be a thick billed uh, fox sparrow. So the range is pretty important. Uh, the city fox sparrow likes uh, the western side more, where the thick billed is essential Oregon uh, habitat. Uh, the uh, city fox sparrow likes damper, while the thick billed likes drier. Uh, they look a lot alike in their features, but uh, one has a little darker of a bill. And uh, so a lot of people say, well, it tends to do such and such. Well, that's subjective. So you want to look at objective things like the call, um, et cetera. Also, watch out for optical illusions. A lot of times you're out there 
the sun's glaring right in your eye, so the lighting's bad. Maybe there's shade, and so you can't really see your shadows. Also expect variation in the birds during different times of the year. Even though it's the summer and a lot of birds are molting, well, there might be a bird with fresh plumage out there. Well, it could be a juvenile that's just got its first juvenile, fresh juvenile plumage on it. And also size can be uh, misleading sometimes. For example, if a bird's 10 feet away, you can probably go by size pretty well. Um, but it's, let's say it's way across Pintail Marsh on the far side, uh, 200 yards away. Well, then it gets a little bit more difficult to determine the size. So you just have to take those things into consideration. So during certain parts of the year, we mentioned moat, take that in consideration. Uh, but you know, the time of the year that, you know, whether it's fresh or whether it's warm, it's feathers. Then when you're IDing a bird, my last tip would be, if you're IDing a bird, uh, IDing 100% of the birds you hear or see, it's just not realistic. Give yourself a break. Tim and I just the other day to, we were out at Battle Creek Park. For the life of us, we just couldn't figure out what this bird is. Some birds have 30 to 40 songs and calls, so sometimes you just don't know them all. And, uh, except that some are gone or gonna get away. You just get your binoculars up and the bird flies away. I mean, there's gonna be those. Also, no two birds are exactly alike. You can have two robins right next to each other and they're gonna be different. So the bottom line, if you just get a brief glimpse at the bird, it might not be identifiable and that's just fine. It's okay to say, I don't know. So tools of the trade. Doesn't take too much to get started. A good pair of binoculars in the $200 to $300 range. Here are the standards. If you get too much magnification, like uh, the 50s, uh, eight by fifties, sometimes it can have more shake and uh, it'll be harder to see and get a little more blurry for some people. Make sure you do the proper settings. They have the directions when you buy the binoculars and also it's good to have a good field guide. And there's a lot of good field guides. I'll send out something after this, uh, along with the recording, a set of some of the resources and stuff that you can use. There you have it. Like we say, good field guides. Here's a few good field guides. Try to get a variety. A good one here, the Birds of the West. The National Geographic one for all of North America is a good one, especially for shore birds and uh, water birds. Here's a good one for birds of prey. And then for a very basic one, just for the Lamb Valley, this is a great book. I know this last one here, Birds of the Lamb Valley, you can get from the Audubon. Like I say, there's birding apps too. And one main thing I'd say, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but before you buy a bird guide, take go to a store that has quite a few of them and actually look at them. Like um, Wild Birds Unlimited on commercial, they have quite a few. Uh, there's a few stores downtown. There's a bookstore. I, the bookman, I believe, has some, including some used books. But um, no... Uh, two guides are exactly the same, and some of them are sort of angled at certain things. The author has a specialty that he likes to emphasize more than others. And so uh, take a good look at it. For example, if you know a bird like a robin or a meadowlark, look at each book. What? How do they describe the meadowlark? And is that how you understand it to be and what's easiest for you to understand the way they uh, state it. How do they cover the, the uh, birds? So here's some field guides, for example, of some pages of one. Here's one on the kestrel. 
This is pretty common. We're here to tell a Kestrel and give some facts about it, uh, about males and uh, how to identify them. What about a juvenile? Here's a range map. Tells about their call and where you might see them. And then over here, it gives some pictures of what you could see and then um, the male versus female and the juvenile, they'll show them in flight too. Here's a different one from a different book on a Kestrel. So a little bit different of a layout. They use different colors for a range map. Gives a little more information here. This is our smallest falcon and common and widespread. There's a few different ways it pictures it. Here's another book. This is on the warblers. But you can see the comparison. I believe this one's Sibley's guide. So the main thing is just look through the birds and uh, uh, in several of the manuals and pick out the one that fits best for you. There's no right answer. Each person is individualistic. So here you can see we have two vireos here. Most likely we wouldn't see one of these vireos, but the way you can tell is by the range of the range map. And so in these, this is off of uh, allaboutbirds.org and they have nice uh, maps here. For example, you can see the blue uh, headed vireo that we see here versus the Cassin's vireo well, the blue head is in the eastern U.S. The Cassin's vireo is here in the west. And you can see breeding, which means mainly spring and summer. Yellow means migration, and blue is winter. If it's purple, then that means it would be year-round in this book. But you have to look at the, which we'll get into in just a second, make sure you look at the front of the book because uh, some guides, they don't put this nice little chart down here uh, to guide you along. You have to know from the front of the book what each color means. And pay attention to the first part of the guide. Here it will tell you the different parts of the bird. It's great to know the different parts of the bird because when somebody says, oh, there was white on the tertials. Well, where in the heck are the tertials? or the primaries uh, were black. So the primaries down here were black, uh, et cetera. So see the whole bird, the face, the leg color, everything, you know, but it's real good to see this and know uh, this information that they have a great deal of introductory information in the very front of each book, which is really helpful. Birding etiquette. When you're out there in a group, especially, want to move slow and together, not get too far apart. Although in COVID, that might be slightly different now. Want to stay a little bit apart. Don't want to be talking too loudly, could scare the birds or interrupt uh, others. As leaders, we really try to do this one here, point out the sightings and make sure everybody has a chance to see it. It's one of the frustrating things, you're there and you've got a life bird and you don't get a chance to see it. Use the clock method, which we'll get into a little bit to designate where the bird is. Don't do like I do and point at the bird. It really bothers some people. Uh, and also work together to identify the bird. You know, it's great to have discussions about it. Oh, I saw this. Well, I saw this. And if everybody saw just a little bit different uh, part of the first part of the bird, somebody saw the tail good, somebody saw the head, somebody saw the leg color, you put that all together, you might come up with a great ID that way. And like we say, it's okay to be wrong. You can always uh, learn from it. 
So here's the concept of the time clock. We have this nice little bird up here. And so you would say, okay, this bird is at two o'clock on the outer side at two o'clock. Let's say there's a bird in here on the perch where you say, well, it's at five o'clock and go inside towards the meadow, towards the trunk. Here, nine o'clock, and it's halfway between the outer uh, limbs and the trunk. So we'd be looking right here. And so you can just use the clock to sort of describe where the bird is. It's halfway up the trunk. So those are some things that will help you. And uh, the main thing is to enjoy it, get out there. Birding with others is great because you can learn a lot. That's how I learned. Uh, coming to the Salem Audubon field trips, how I learned the most thing and going to field trips in other areas. Also, it doesn't hurt to spend time alone with the birds. So you can just sort of sit there and study them and take your time. Some people find it uh, nice to try to, to learn to draw the birds and stuff so you can uh, put down in a drawing what you saw and that can help identify it. And I'll note now that I just got an email that there's going, California Audubon is going to have a nice bird drawing class by this renowned uh, bird artist from Northern California. And I believe if you go to the California Audubon website that you should be able to look there and see when uh, the class is, and I believe it's free, and it comes in three sections. I took two of the sections, drawing just regular perching birds, drawing shorebirds, and drawing raptors. It was a very good class, and uh, this guy, I can't remember, his last name was Laws, but a very good instructor. Took you from the very beginning of where you start drawing and uh, so, and they have you do exercises, uh, drawing the birds, etc. cetera. Salem Audubon, during normal times, we offer bird walks. Uh, you can see it at salemaudubon.org, but we're just starting a new concept. Uh, Paul Evans, who I believe is here on our uh, thing today, in our class is uh, leading a bird walk, but we're only taking five people out at a time. Uh, have to wear a mask, social distance, uh, et cetera. So we'll have more of these. It seems like it's going to be a very successful concept because people want to get out there. Um, so we'll probably have some more of these uh, COVID-19 type bird walks, call them pod walks. So like I say, get out there. Uh, here are some of the great places. I would cross off Cascade Gateway Park now. Um, that park has sort of uh, been taken off the list uh, here. There's just a lot of people, and I believe there's a homeless camp there now, and uh, so it's not the best place right at this time. But Kaiser Rapids is great, the Lamb Mission Park, Brian Johnson Park, South Salem. And Tim and I and some others are gonna get out there. Um, if you, um, we have a bird uh, walk list, a field trips list, email list that we have. If you aren't on that and would like to be on it, you can email us at salemaudubon.org, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, Salem Audubon Society at gmail.com, and I'll get you on the list, but we're going to start sending out more of these bird reports from different places in the valley and nearby where you can go birding and explain where it is, how large it is, where are the best birding places, what birds you could see, and things like that. So um, we think that would be really useful, and I've sent out a couple of those emails already and we're getting pretty good reviews on them, so we'll probably continue it. Local birding festivals, 
during notable times. Most of them have been canceled this year, but here's a list of some of the birding festivals. And a lot of you, it's great to go to a birding festival. You learn so much and see some birds that you haven't seen. For example, some of the great ones are Winter Wings and Klamath Falls in February, the Woodpecker Festival and Sisters, Southeast Arizona one in uh, Tucson, Oregon Shorebird Festival, Coos Bay, and of course the Rio Grande Valley one in uh, Harlingen, Texas. Uh, also, there's San Diego Birding Festival. There's quite a few great ones. You can sort of see each part of the country. There's also one, the biggest week uh, of the year in Ohio is another great one. You can also say you can't get out there, make your yard uh, birdie. Put out sources that birds like. Uh, they need nectar, like hummingbirds. And it doesn't hurt to leave it out year round, but make sure you keep it nice and up to date and clean and uh, because it can get moldy in this hot weather pretty quick. And you don't want to freeze in the winter and have their tongue freeze. But having uh, fruits and berries, having good plants that have fruits and berries and plants that for the hummingbirds, like you see here, uh, there's lots of good flowers, columbine, for example, uh, fuchsias, nuts and seeds for the birds. And of course, they like insects and certain plants draw insects. So uh, during the summer, they really need insects for protein. And then that way, you can just sit out your window like I do some days and you can just see the birds come right to your feeder. So at this point, I'd say if there's any questions, uh, go ahead and bring those up. And uh, like I said, I'll bring out the re uh, send you a copy of a lot of the books that you can uh, get and some of the resources online. Trisha has her hand up. I I uh, allowed you to to unmute yourself, Patricia, if you'd like to ask a question or put it in the chat box. Patricia earlier had made a comment that it's hard to see beyond color in a bird uh, to see some of the things you're talking about. It's a challenge to see beyond the color and some of the obvious features. Uh, yes, that's very true. I mean, when you have some of these birds like a uh, cardinal or um, even chickadees, I think are just a beautiful bird, but uh, yes, you can really get uh, honed in on the color and all of my bird class I've taken in uh, Arizona and the rest of the places, uh, that's one of the things they say is that you just, especially in Arizona, you can't get hooked on the color or else it's going to be a lot harder to um, identify the birds. Uh, but I agree, it's hard to avoid the color. Diana asks, uh, I read somewhere that birds will avoid white houses, not the White House, she comments. Is this true? Uh, that's good. I mean, I don't, uh, I really don't know. I haven't heard about that one. Uh, I know they don't like bright objects and uh, sometimes and light uh, coming on them in certain uh, angles. Yeah, I've never heard that about that. Have you, Tim? No. I think if you put food and water and other uh, things to attract them, they, they, they could probably, uh, I would think they'd care less about a white house, but uh, the color of the house, but um, I, I've never heard that. Okay. Mike mentioned the virtual field trip city is sending out now, which uh, have become really popular. Uh, you'll see in the Kestrel, uh, when the September Kestrel comes out, that we've also created um, a, a Google um, list that members can um, join, can, can, uh, can ask to be uh, part of, and then that will enable anybody on the list to talk to each other, to send emails to the list about questions they may have or bird um, sightings that they've seen that they'd like to report. It's something that some of the other clubs have that allow uh, members to chat with each other. 
and uh, so uh, that's an option now, and we'll see how that uh, see how that goes. Okay, and then right now uh, up here, I have the next webinars are coming up uh, here. I'm trying a couple of new ones here, like Birding Minto Brown Park, for example, um, showing uh, the park. Of course, most everyone on here knows where the park is, but for the people that don't, uh, showing the park and sort of the trail maps and which directions we go, what birds you could see at various times of the year. Another one would be where to go birding in October, and we'll go through and talk about different birding locations where you go for good birds in October. One, and then the big classes we have as far as ID are the shorebird ID one and the sparrow ID. The sparrow ID one's gonna be a pretty great class. We were asked uh, quite a few times to have it and uh, try to get help people identify the little brown jobs. Mike Ann Shriver has a question. Okay. Uh, her question is, what size binoculars do you recommend for beginner uh, birders? Um, I reckon, uh, recommend either the 8x32s or the 8x42s. And just buy the best binoculars you can. Um, the pair I like really well for a beginning pair is a Nikon Monarch 5. They cost about $280. Um, there's some other ones that you can get like the Vortex Diamondback. They're pretty good beginning binoculars and I believe they're around 150 or so, uh, 200. And then you can take a jump from there and go up to the Vortex Viper HD. Those are about uh, $589. And then after that, then you get into the Swarovskis and stuff where they're 2000 plus. Uh, but yeah, I'd say Nikon and most of your Vortex, uh, Swarovski and some of your brand names are probably the best ones to go with. There's a few more questions that have come in, Mike. Okay. Uh, Diane asks, uh, so Diane says that Mike mentioned a type of feather on birds. Uh, can you discuss that a little bit further? Uh, other oh. birds? What I, um, I mentioned naturally the primary is, let's see if I can go back to this one diagram. Um, so um, we were talking birds, uh, feathers like, so here on this diagram, these are the primaries here. For example, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's nine primaries in most birds. So these are the primaries. Then uh, if this was a little unfold, there's the secondaries back here and the tertiaries on this bird are inside here. But it's basically the, uh, the let me get back here. The, my cursor keeps going away. The primaries, the secondary and the tertiaries are in here. And those are the feathers, uh, the uh, flight feathers, the bird. Also, uh, Joy asked if you could send a list of the upcoming uh, webinars, classes. Sure. And then Hillary asked, is the Birding Minto Brown Island Park a webinar uh, or held at Minto Island Park? It is a webinar and uh, yeah, we'll just be going over uh, so that you can go down there on your own since we're in COVID or, you know, if, uh, you know, you'll know better some of the routes to take and we're going to talk about a long four mile hike and a short, uh, you know, one mile hike, for example, and even some shorter than that. So we'll hopefully have something for everybody that would meet everyone's needs as far as they want to walk. And I will have coming webinars. Diane asks about other features of the anatomy that might be useful for IDing birds. Um, well, um, 
I mean, almost every part is a little bit like we discussed the head and the shape of the head. When we get into the Sparrow ID class, uh, this will really come in handy because, for example, some uh, sparrows have rounder heads uh, than others, white crown sparrow, whereas let's say a grasshopper sparrow, it almost has a flat head. And so it's those type of things you can look at. The uh, size and uh, shape of the bill, the length, the color of the bill, um, you can, um, the scapulars here, color of the legs, uh, the tail, uh, color it might have at the end of it, like this has a little white on it or it has banding that you can look for. Like for example, a cedar waxwing has yellow down here. We also have the undertail coverts, which are the um, right underneath the tail um, it, are the coverts, the undertail coverts right underneath the tail. And in some of them, it's like on certain toys and stuff, it's sort of a rusty brown. Uh, color. Um, you can talk about the nape here. Um, the other, you know, could have designs or like a red-tailed hawk. A lot of them have a V shape on the back. But yeah, there's just all kinds. The length of the tail. Some have real short tails. Uh, but those are some of the things that you can look at. But there's just a lot. But also go to the uh, beginning of your birding ID book, and a lot of them will go into some of these details. And the wing shape in flight can be helpful too. Right. Any other questions for Mike? You want to raise your hand? I could turn your mic on so you don't have to try to figure out how to type something into the chat box. But you would have to figure out how to raise your hand. So I don't know. It might be easier just to go to the chat box. So looks like we might not have any more questions. Well, I think that um, that might be it, Mike. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone very much for uh, attending the class tonight and wish you successful birding and hopefully we'll see it future uh, webinars that we're going to have. Uh, usually going to have two to three a month. Uh, some of them will uh, have a fee for them, the ones that are more intense and uh, a lot more knowledge and a lot more information goes into them and they usually last two hours. For example, shortbird ID and the sparrow ID one will be two hours, where these other free ones are an hour long. The woodpecker basics, we only charge five dollars because um, it's only an hour class because we only have about 12 woodpeckers to discuss that make Oregon home. Uh, so I will send out a copy of the recording to everybody signed up, a copy of the upcoming webinars, and a list of resources that you can use. Well, thanks a lot. We'll go ahead and end. I'll stop my share. And well, thank you, Mike, very much for another interesting and informative webinar. Okay, thank you, and I'll end the recording.